Hey. Okay. Um, hey, I'm Tomer. I'm a VP Tech Strategy at the Stellar Development Foundation, and today we're all about Sorbonne. So, um, this is a fairly informal session. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a bit about um, what Alex and the Script3 folks are, are building, um, talk a bit about Sorbonne, take some uh, questions from, uh, from the audience, and uh, just try to have some fun along the way. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, Moots, tell us a bit. Do you go by Alex or by Moots? Both work. Okay. Well, if you're on Discord, then Moots is more natural. Um, okay, so tell us a bit about Script3. Yeah, so my name's Alex Moots. Um, I'm the CTO here at Script3. Uh, basically, we are a dev shop that likes to build DeFi, and we've been working a bit around the um, Stellar and um, ETH world. And currently, one of our main priorities now is we're really trying to bring a money market of a stellar, such has been our relationship with Tomer and the uh, SDF team. Awesome. So, you know, we were talking a bit about how Soroban is, uh, you know, just getting started and we're ready for early adopters. And uh, Script3 are really great early adopters. So I think it's a great opportunity to learn from their experience. So let's break this down for a bit. Uh, first, uh, for people who don't necessarily know what a money market is, maybe you can uh, share some information about, generally speaking, what a money market is, don't need to go into too many details, um, and uh, specifically what your vision is for a money market. Yeah, of course. So basically what a money market is, is it's just a place that um, allows users to borrow and lend money from each other. Um, and one of the things that we're really looking for is getting a fully decentralized money market, which allows anyone to lend and anyone to borrow from each other. Um, common things on other worlds that other people might have known are things like Aave and Compound. Um, so really just allowing users to basically like um, use capital in the most efficient way possible that's on chain. So what we're seeing a lot of interesting activity in the DeFi space around, around lending and borrowing. What is it about, uh, specifically about like crypto, about trust minimized uh, like networks that make it so appealing for this type of uh, activity? Honestly, part of the thing that's, that's best about it is it's, it's fully trustless. So as a user wanting to participate, it doesn't matter where I am, it doesn't matter what bank I use or if I even have a bank. Um, if I have access to the internet, um, I can lend my money to someone who's going to then use it and generate profit. Um, that's way better than money just sitting around being stale. And it's one of the most important things I think we can bring to Stellar. That's awesome. And how is, uh, how is your protocol different from uh, the other things that you've mentioned? Yeah, of course. And so currently in the world of, of current smart contracts, um, they're kind of built around uh, other blockchains. And one thing that's really neat about Stellar is Stellar has a really impressive suite of anchors. And this is one of the most important things that we can leverage when it comes to making money markets, because anchors are basically people that are bringing sets of assets out to Stellar and building up focused money markets for these anchors really limits the risk profile that any user who's then trying to lend or borrow set assets has to deal with. Because if I want to lend and borrow USDC on ETH, well, I'm now stuck with the Aave DAO and the 40 assets that are currently supported to be lent, currently supported as collateral, um, of which I might not trust 25 of them. And I'm now subscribed to that situation, which doesn't have to be the case in Stellar. And uh, can you tell us a bit about, I know we've been talking about the different properties of Sorbonne. Um, how do um, how do these apply to Scripties, and what is it about Sorbonne that um, contributes to, to to your protocol? Of course, I think one of the most important things that Sorbonne brings to the equation um, is actually its interoperability layer with Stellar Classic. Um, one thing I really appreciate about that is it's really simple. So we basically have taken a a, a look at it, saying, look, assets are probably the most important thing on Stellar. So why not we just make assets the thing that's compatible between the two? And just doing that alone, um, it's, it's, it's easy to use. So I know that if I have an asset on Stellar Classic or if I have an asset on Sorbonne, they're available in both places. One thing that's awesome about that is that Sorbonne smart contracts can take like tons of advantage of things like the DEX, things like anchors. And that alone is like one of the most important things to leverage that Sorbonne offers. 
That's awesome. So a lot of people here are really interested in building smart contracts. Um, and what kind of advice could you give to people who are making their first steps, both in the world of smart contracts in general, and specifically in Stellar. So if they're coming from other ecosystems, what should they expect? Tell us the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sure. I'll start with maybe one of the things that I've noticed most as I've been tinkering around here that uh, I've noticed is different. Um, I come from a background of ETH mostly, so I'm going to talk from context of there. Um, but one of the things that I think has been most different is just kind of the way that you're conceptualizing and thinking about storage and efficiency. Um, so to touch on the storage aspect, Eve has a very fine grained rules of how stuff's written in red, um, and the gas fees are it's you know, 600 I believe to write a store or something. And one thing that's interesting about Sorbonne is there's going to be a more dynamic fee system, and something to kind of keep track of is how you store things actually really affects the efficiency. So it's not only like oh I have a contract with balances I'm just going to throw a map out, everyone can use them. There's a little bit more to consider. And it, it, one thing that I've appreciated is I feel like I'm using more classic programming knowledge that I've had in the past rather than ETH-specific gas golfing, um, which while it was really fun, I'm not gonna lie, is probably not that applicable to writing things that are safe and secure. Um, and on that note, uh, Tomer talked earlier about footprints and uh, the ability to run contracts in parallel. And this is kind of the thing that allows you to write efficient contracts, A and B, um, makes you really think about your storage model in a different way from ETH. Um, so that's kind of like one of the biggest things that I've noticed that's different. Um, obviously, I'll, I guess I'll start with the bad first <laughs> and get that out of the way. But honestly, the thing that's, that's, been, that's been hardest for me is it's growing so quickly. Um, I've been trying to build, or basically been tinkering since the day announced that we were able to, and um, it's changed immensely since then. And keeping track of it's been really difficult, but that's expected and something that's new and growing. And uh, obviously changed for the better. Oh yes, changed for the better. And to see the improvement that we've actually gone from some of my first contracts I was trying to write, even just like replicating an ARC20 token, to how much easier it actually is um, now is kind of mind-blowing that we've made that much progress in two months. It makes me really confident for the future. And I think we've reached a point where even if you feel a little wary about trying to dip your feet in, um, it's definitely worth it and it's, it's, it's definitely getting ready. So. Yeah, and I think that uh, you know you uh, were part of the crowd who uh, was commenting a lot on the auth semantics that we had, uh, uh, our authorization mechanism. Uh, it was very uh, powerful and advanced from the get-go, and um, uh, a lot of people were asking what the fuck because it was very difficult to get uh, shit done. But uh, I think we've we've uh, built like a more like tiered approach to authorization, so you can have both basic message dot sender like functionality from Ethereum, but also more advanced uh, authorization semantics. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and even to go a little further on on that note. Uh, and flexibility and authorization is something that you see a lot of proposals around ETH on. Um, account abstraction was a big thing. It got benched for the merge. And now, like, I don't know, I think there's been a lot of, like, noise about new account abstraction and how much work it's going to be just to support things like more interesting signature schemes, which thankfully Sorobon's getting by inheritance because we can go ask Stellar Classic, hey, like, what's this account signer requirement? And we can figure that out from the get-go. And kind of the other thing that's pretty interesting is um, authorization is not like ingrained or done for you per se. Um, so it gives you a little flexibility to use it in more interesting ways. I can give a real quick example, but in the money market world, let's say I'm a user who's running, running a lot of arbitrage bots. I'm trading, you know, X plus 10 assets. Um, I can deposit only USDC and then borrow whatever asset I want and then use that to perform my arbitrage. So I don't need to have like millions and millions of dollars of all 10 assets that I'm trying to arbitrage between, I can kind of keep it simple. And the way that this is doable on ETH is there's crazy like signature things that are going on. There's tons of lines of code of like ingrained like uh, signatures, like signing stuff that shouldn't be the part of the developer's problem. Um, and with Soroban, we actually can use signatures flexibly to do this basically for free from the developer's point of view. Obviously, there's been a ton of work on the host side to make this do, but 
Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I was talking about simplicity and sensibility. We really want to push people towards sensible design patterns. So if you want to do, you know, weird, crazy shit, you can do it. But, uh, you know, the platform really pushes you towards uh, best practices and, and sensible design. Awesome. Um, so one thing that I wanted to add, I think a lot of people have been talking about the interop between what we call Stellar Classic and, and, uh, and Soroban. Um, and it's worth mentioning, again, like I said before, when we say classic, we're talking about the, the existing set of operations. It's a bit confusing because in other net networks, people call classic forks. This is not a fork. Um, uh, but you know, one of the biggest uh, dilemmas we had when designing Sorbonne is how do we balance between having a very powerful system um, that is kind of like future-proof versus uh, something that is ingrained in the current protocol. And where we landed is that Sorbon is a completely new smart contracts platform. It doesn't actually take any dependencies on Stellar from a software perspective. Uh, that's a bit of a lie, but there's some small dependencies, but we're getting rid of, rid of them. Um, but where we landed is that it's a whole new uh, platform. It can run outside the context of Stellar. You can do that, but you can do it by running the sandbox. And the way that it connects to Stellar is via two main concepts, which are assets and accounts. So all Stellar accounts are also um, also hold for uh, for Soroban. So your Stellar account, if you submit a transaction with your Stellar account, uh, it will show up on uh, Soroban. You can actually query for account information from the Stellar side. And in addition, you can also uh, wrap and unwrap assets from the classic Stellar side. So you can move a balance from Stellar balance into uh, Soroban token balance, which looks kind of like an ERC-20 uh, token, not exactly. Um, and that's it. So a lot of people are asking us about the DEX, AMMs, annual balances, sponsorships, a lot of concepts and classic. You can still move your asset uh, to classic and do these things, but you cannot interact with, it, with them from your program. Um, and that's a very uh, critical decision that we made in order to be able to build for a concurrency. Uh, for future concurrency, we just uh, plugging into the actual code of Stellar Classic would have been, uh, would have had serious performance implications. Awesome. Um, Lutz, before we go to the, audi the audience, is there anything else you want to add about your experience on working with Soroban, hanging out in Discord, having fun with Graydon and Lee? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I really encourage you all to jump in this Discord. Um, it's incredible how open that the SDF team has been with their thought process, their development patterns. Um, it's been great for me to learn, even from their great developers, as, as, as I'm growing as a developer as well. Um, and there's just a plethora of information that will really benefit anyone who's interested as well. So I, I really encourage you to come take a peek. Um, there's been fun discussions, and I'm sure there'll be more to come. So. Oh yeah, lots of opinions there. Awesome. Um, and with that, before we go into uh, questions, I do want to give a shout out to the SDF engineers who have been working on this. Some of them are here. Siddharth is here. Tyler is here somewhere in the background. Uh, Paul is here. He'll be giving a talk later. These are the people who are making this hap uh, happen. Thank you so much. Um, cool. Let's take some questions. Just said something about wrapping, wrapping the assets from the yeah. original classic yeah. chain. Can you talk a little, a little more about Sh that? Sure. So if you've ever used uh, on Ethereum, um, if you've ever used ETH in various uh, protocols, you might have had to convert your ETH into WETH because ETH is like a native asset and WETH is an ERC-20 token that wraps around. So that's a, that's a good mental model to think about how assets move between the class of Stellar Protocol and uh, the bond side of things. So you actually explicitly need from the Sorbonne side to call a function. Uh, these are called import or export. So basically you can import an asset from the Stellar Classic side into a Sorbonne token balance and you could do that vice versa with the export function. Um, a lot of this interop is still in flux and we're trying to kind of like figure out what's the, 
um, you know, what's the best ratio between having something that is as kind of like simple and powerful that it can be versus like something that has like a batteries included user experience. Um, we, want, we want this to be frictionless for the actual user. Uh, so moving between the two sides are not going to be, it's not going to be uh, uh, too much work for them. And to add, not having the special case ETH at smart contracts is wonderful. So I highly recommend it. Questions? Um, the import export just got me on something. Um, talk about a little bit about security and the atomic operation that that might be, and how safe are we? <laughs> uh, from an atomicity perspective, you are um, you still have the same uh, atomicity guarantees that you have with the classic Stellar protocol. So basically, if a smart contract is invoked, uh, either everything happens or nothing happens. Uh, that also uh, applies to cross-contract calls. So let's say I, I, I make a, uh, a contract, I make a, a call to another contract to do something. If they error out, then the entire thing is rolled out. So this is something that's a bit important to understand about smart contracts, and it's, it's a bit confusing because you have semantics uh, of, of a database, but the code looks like kind of like regular imperative code, which is a bit misleading because uh, everything rolls back, so you never have like partial execution. Can you have multiple different uh, contract invocations in the same transaction envelope? So it's all atomic? Um, so no, but it's not a big deal. So um, if, if you guys are familiar with the current uh, Stellar transactions, then uh, you can in fact introduce multiple operations in the transactions with the current uh, protocol. Soroban is a bit different. So we have an invoke host function operation. That's how we introduce Soroban to Stellar. And uh, you can only have one operation in, a, in that transaction. So once you have an invoke Soroban host function, that's it. You cannot have any more operations in that transaction. However, if you want to do multiple invocations within that, it's very simple. Just deploy a contract that has the multiple invocation, call that contract. So uh, it's very easy to orchestrate uh, that on the Soroban side. Okay, awesome. Uh, I think we're almost at time. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Paul will be demonstrating how to build a contract 1 p.m. today. Uh, very exciting stuff. Thank you all for sticking around. Have a great day. Thanks for your time.